Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 29 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's neat and new with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. Today's episode features clarinetist Michael Dean, who is an accomplished performer and teacher who many may also know as Clarinet Mike from his work with the popular blog of the same name. In fact, his blog has been accessed in 147 countries, six continents, and counting. In addition to blogging, Michael's work has appeared in journals such as Southwestern Musician, Wind Player, the National Association of College Wind and Percussion Instructors Journal, and Bandmasters Review. As a performer, Dr. Michael Dean is a BG France performing artist who maintains a national and international profile with recent recitals and masterclasses in Spain, Iowa, Missouri, Louisiana, and Texas. Summer 2016 saw recitals in Arlington and Austin, Texas, Lawrence, Kansas at Clarinet Fest, a clarinet clinic at the Texas Bandmasters Association Convention, and a residency as clarinet artist faculty at the Orfeo Music Festival 2016 in Vipiteno, Italy. He has appeared as a recitalist at Carnegie Hall and has sustained a record of recitals, clinics, masterclasses, and presentations at international, national, and state conferences. He also tours as a solo recitalist and clinician internationally and across the United States. His playing has been featured on five commercially available CDs, and he is currently preparing a new CD called Postcards from Silver Lake. He also has a YouTube channel where you can listen to some of his recordings online. Michael is currently an active teacher and performer and is based in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. You can find Michael online at clarinetmike.com, that's clarinetmike.com, and the direct link to his popular blog is clarinetmike.wordpress.com. Again, that's clarinetmike.wordpress.com. In this episode, we discuss a wide range of topics ranging from how his blog got started, his CD recordings, and numerous practice and playing tips, such as his artsy system and the concept of loading and unloading your ideas. The giveaway for this episode is a signed copy of Michael's new CD called Mysteries. If you'd like to make sure you're eligible to win items mentioned on the podcast, please visit clarineat.com and be sure to sign up for our email mailing list. This episode was brought to you by D'Addario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. Hi Mike, and welcome to the clarinet.com podcast. Hello! Great to speak to you. So many, many listeners have been requesting some sort of uh, teaching advice or pedagogical uh, episode, and I thought you'd be a great person to talk to because uh, not only are, are you an established performer and teacher, but you also are the the uh, the owner and creator of the clarine- clarinet. I just said clarinet mic, clarinet mic blog. What can you tell me about that blog? What was your purpose in found, founding it? Oh, thanks. I'm really honored to be on your podcast, and hello to everyone listening. Um, yeah, five years ago, my wife uh, mentioned to me and said you know, you ought to start a blog. And I thought, okay. And so I started thinking about it and exploring how to do it. And I started writing uh, posts on various topics and it just sort of grew from there. And uh, uh, so I've really enjoyed doing it. It's been very positive and uh, the feedback's been really excellent. Um, You know, uh, the purpose of the blog is is to is to really help people to help clarinetists and also to support the activities that I do. There seems to be a lot of things on there for very beginners, but also more advanced students. And uh, who, who's your kind of target market for it? Well, it kind of moves around. I, I I think I have a special emphasis for the young clarinetists who don't have access to a private teacher. Mm-hmm. Here in Dallas Fort Worth, we have. Um, it seems private lesson teachers with advanced degrees, masters, and even doctorates teaching freelance and and whatnot. But if you go out in the country, you know, you oftentimes in a, in a community, the only person who has any clarinet knowledge at all would be the band director. And maybe they had a semester of clarinet at the most when they were working on their under their uh, bachelor of music education degree. So I try to push out information that will be helpful to a student trying to study clarinet or to a band director who you know, maybe had a semester, a half semester at the most on the clarinet, trying to give them 
you know, information that would be useful to them. So when you're first starting out a blog, I, I know because um, I've had a few blogs in the past that never really went anywhere. And it's interesting because I am, um, I'm just now thinking of starting a blog aspect up on Clarinet here because um, there seems to be some interest in that kind of news items and things. But uh, when you're first starting, how did you keep it motivated to continue when, when the readership was just, just sort of blossoming or did it kind of explode right away or how did that go? Well, I think the idea was uh, when you're very busy, you just do what you can. And I, and I had some ideas and I started pushing them out. I also tried to write blog posts that I would want to read. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned yesterday about having a show that you would like to listen to. And I think, um, I think that's a good thing because uh, sometimes blogs and articles tend to be too long, seems to me. You know, I rarely will push out a blog post that's real long because I know how busy I am and I know how busy, you know. So I, I try to keep it short and to the point. I, I want to read um, and, and check out things that aren't too long. You know, it's specifically on my blog. It's specifically on my blog. So. Well, you're fairly prolific. I mean, I, I think I see a post go up every couple of days. Um, was it like that at the beginning too or more just kind of a little hobby project at the start? Well, it depends on how much time I have and how much inclination I have. I've been pushing out, you know, I think eventually, you know, it, try to post every week or week or two. Here lately I've been posting once a week with a lot of things. I have a lot of activity this summer, and uh, I've been on a big push here lately. I've had a little more time. It just depends on how much time I have versus how much inclination I have versus what's, what's on my mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I, suspect, I suspect eventually here I'll probably cut it back to once every couple of weeks or so, and maybe even once a month. So, But, you know, it, 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 takes, it takes different time depending on what I'm interested in so how's the feedback been because I know too that sometimes you know you can feel like you're throwing stuff out into the computer screen and and you don't even really know if anyone's seeing it but are people commenting or responding or how's that well I think you know my wife and I were talking about this um, recently it seems like you, you, you throw you know people are reading it but you don't always get feedback I think what you have is periodically you get you get insights into how many people are looking at it and um, I, I know I know yesterday all of a sudden I had 17 hits in China yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know and I thought wow where did that come from and I think you know and or I was at a conference a couple years ago and I was walking I was it was the Oklahoma symposium and I was walking across the street going to my hotel and somebody stopped me and said Hey, you're clarinet Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay, it's you know, and, and and other times I've been at you know clarinet fest, and, you know, and, and people would say, oh, we all read your blog, and so I think a lot people do read it, and you know, you know, in the clarinet world, we're not we're not going to be on the cover of Time magazine here, but yeah. in our but in our niche, we have people who are interested in these kinds of things. Well, that is kind of why I started this too, because I, I was talking to actually Peter Spriggs one day and I, we talked for over an hour and, and when I hung up, I was like, man, there's some really interesting stories there. I mean, I can't be the only person who'd like to hear that stuff and, and especially students who you know, don't have the chance to, to talk to people really in the industry outside of their, their teacher, you know, to get yeah. a chance to listen to all these people. It's, it's really cool. So are you going to Clarinet Fest this year? Oh, yes. I'm, in fact, I'm performing at it. I'll see you there then. Um, what are you playing? Well, thank you. Yes, I'm uh, performing a new piece of music called Postcards from Silver Lake. Uh, it's for clarinet, alto, saxophone, and piano. It was written for Gary Gray uh, out at UCLA by a, a West Coast composer named Mark Carlson. It was written about six years ago, and uh, I, I don't think it's even been recorded, so I'm looking forward to hopefully recording that this coming year with um, some some a friend a couple of friends out here in uh, Dallas Fort Worth uh, for my new CD that I'm planning to work on this next year. Um, yeah, it's a cool piece. It's sort of um, Mark Carlson said that when he writes a piece of music, he oftentimes has leftover ideas. 
that he doesn't use. And so the movements in Postcards from Silver Lake are from different uh, pieces that he didn't use. They're leftover musical ideas. And so he calls it Postcards from Silver Lake because he lives in the Silver Lake uh, neighborhood of Los Angeles. And so, and they, they the first two, well, I'm playing the first two movements and, uh, they're sort of they're, they're they're really steeped in jazz. They're sort of like film noir ballads, you know, from the early 1950s. They're very very interesting music, and uh, it really works for clarinet and saxophone. And I'll be performing with Todd Oxford, who's the saxophone professor at the University of Te excuse me Texas State University San Marcos. He went to the University of Texas, which is where I met him. Hmm. So we we just played this last Friday night. Uh, we we did it and it was very well received and we had a lot of fun. He's just a good friend. Well, you know what's funny? I, I just thought of a rather s silly analogy, <laughs> but uh, sometimes remnants of things can turn out to be the best part. I mean, this is uh, taking it to food almost, but you know, you make a soup out of something that's left over from another meal, and man, it can be a good soup. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I, mean, I think that like composers when they do do a large project and they have extra ideas, I mean, it's not like they're less good ideas. Maybe there just wasn't room. Maybe they're great ideas. Yeah, well, and the, especially the second movement is entitled Late at Night. It's really, it's just loaded with jazz, and it sounds like right from a, uh, a film noir movie from 1950s. It's uh, it very much like Late at Night. It's, it's just very, very heartfelt. It's sort of like Frank Sinatra singing I'm a Fool to Want You about Ava, you know. But anyway, so... <laughs> It's just really quite a tremendous piece, and I think I think it'll be quite a splash at Clarinet Fest. I think people will find it very interesting. Have you recorded this piece? No, I'm I'm planning to record it this um, fall for for a new CD entitled Postcards from Silver Lake. Um, and so I'm sit, I'm sitting on a bunch of music I'm looking to record. I I. Uh, Somebody mentioned in one of the reviews of my CDs that I'm good at finding new music. Well, I guess. That is an just, important skill. <laughs> well, I just look for music that I like. Mm -hmm. I think, I think you know, there's, there's so much wonderful new music that's being written these days. And, and I try to look for pieces that, I, frankly, I like, you know, that I think are appealing. And I oftentimes like to look for music that's about something. Mm, program music. Yeah, I, that's not always, but oftentimes I find that music to be real appealing. Yeah. And, um, well, it tells a story and something you can share that way. Yeah, and I, I also have a deep love. Um, like like my teacher, I, I have a deep love for jazz, and so uh, and so oftentimes much of the music I play has got jazz in it. So you also play sax, right? Yes, I do. Cool. So let's go back to the um, the, yes. blog, the blog just for a second here. Let's talk about some of the tips you got on the website there. I saw a really great post this week about summer tips for clarinet players, and you've got some about different playing ideas and techniques. And uh, what would you like to share about that? Yeah, that one. That one's one of the most hit posts I've ever had. This recent <laughs> um, one. Yes, it, it's been a real monster. It's gotten as much press, as much interest as anything I've ever posted. I. I posted it last summer and it just went off the charts. Um, well, I actually, I think that part of the reason it's it's uh, so compelling is because it's, it has a general kind of interest because it, it came out in the summer last year when people were thinking about summer things. Also, I think part of the reason it was interesting is because to people is because it has, says 10, 10, has the word 10 in it. You know, it's like if you read, read, a, read a news story on, on the internet, and then at the bottom they have these, these, these uh, paid advertisement articles. Oh, you know, top clickbait. Yeah, yeah, it says top, you know, and I look at them sometimes too, like everybody else, I can't resist. Top 10 places to live that have the best weather. And so I want to see how, you know, Dallas Fort Worth stacks up to, you know, in the, and so we all read these. And so I think there was something about this one that had that kind of makes people want to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of clickbait, uh, nature. So, so that was last summer, eh? Cause I, you just posted it the other day, but I didn't look at the date. Yeah. I, I spruced it up and repost it because uh, I, I had such dynamic readership. I decided I would put it out again. 
So number 10 on there was actually kind of interesting. Because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it yet, but <laughs> number That's 10, okay. you mentioned uh, taking a break, doing something else. I, and I thought that was actually a really important tip. Why is that an important tip? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, common sense says that you have to take some time off. Um, you know, it's sort of like practicing. If I'm, if I'm, nobody, should, you, you know, uh, practicing every day is bad because, you know, your limbs get tired and your mind gets tired. There's just so much you can do before things, you know, break down. Mm -hmm. When I was working on my doctorate, I can remember I got to a point because I had, I simply had more work than I could do with studying and practicing and whatnot. And I remember I got to a point where I had to stop at five o'clock on Friday. I had to stop and then I would come back to work on Sunday afternoon after I got home from church. And then I would go back to work and I would work till midnight and stop and then I would get up and that was my life. I, I you know, and if I had something going on Saturday, I would take Sunday off and I had to take a, a day off. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I was, I was, I was unmarried. I had no, con you know, I had no responsibilities other than to go to school. You know, I was a teaching assistant, so it was all there at school. And I just got to where I had to have that time, that whole day off so I could function. And I think, uh, it, it, it's very useful. In fact, before I do a recital, I'll even take the day off before and just rest so yeah. that I'm fresh. Cause I, and I, I think the, the, the key is the key is to be fresh and to, to make sure you're getting the most accomplished in the time we have. Yeah, I find the same thing, actually. I, I used to try and work as much as possible all the time, too. And I found that the quality of the work was getting so poor. And, you know, in four hours, I would get less done than I would in a real focused 30 minutes on a good day, you know? Precisely. So you have to take that that break. And when you're self-employed, too, we've had a couple of guests on here about the business of music. And one of the hardest things about being self-employed is, is giving yourself a break. Um, but any good coach would do that for you. So you kind of have to either find that from some sort of coaching or, or mentorship situation or really be disciplined with yourself. Well, precisely. And, and there's times to push through and there's times to take a break. And sometimes it's difficult to know. It's, it's very much like practicing, you know, um, if you practice proper, I was, I did a little bit of research over the years on how to practice. And there's many people who feel that anything more than 45 minutes of practice at any one time, is going to become counterproductive. You know, you're playing, but you're not absorbing any information. You know, so one of the things I try to push on my my uh, very best students is to try to practice in 30 to 45 segments. To try to do, you know, three, four, even five segments a day, mm -hmm. but space, but space them out. You know, and because uh, what matters is the quality of work you get accomplished, not even how much time you spend. Well, this might be opening up a can of worms, but it's one of the problems actually I have with uh, with with band practice sheets. So many teachers give the student a practice sheet, and and in a way, sometimes thirty minutes of practice maybe isn't what they need. Maybe they need an hour, but maybe they also only need fifteen. You know, they have right. to plan what they're doing and, and kind of have a goal. But maybe that's another thought for you. What do you think of a goal-oriented practice routine instead of a time-oriented one? Oh. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. It depends on what works for anyone's situation. I know that's kind of a pat answer. <laughs> um, uh, but as a former professor, that's the kind of way you speak, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can't help it. You know, of course, yes. It's, it's very much like my uh, dissertation advisor who uh, had two speeds when I would turn in my dissertation. He either, he either, he either uh, said, I don't see any problems at this point, or he has a concern. Uh -huh. I was only two speed. I was in line finishing my doctorate, and I said, "Well, do you do you see any concerns yet?" <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but but nevertheless, um, uh, nevertheless, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I hard to say. It depends on a given situation. Uh, I mean, I think certainly, you know, sometimes it's hard to control the results, which takes me into an area that I'm very interested in, and I, and I think. Being so, what does it mean to actually accomplish something? You know, I mean, mm. you, get, you get to where you can play a scale, but you've never really got it. You know, yeah. I was working with this, you know, and so I, I you know, cer certainly you want to get kids up to a standard to where they can, you know, pat they down here they do pass offs. You know, my daughter in junior high, she was taking a pass off, they have to get to a level on the piece 
to where they can accomplish it and they give them a grade actually. So what does a pass off mean? Like a test? Well, yeah. So for example, let's say, let's say that they're, all the kids are preparing for an all district competition. Well, she would have all the clarinets in the top band uh, be ready on, say, the C major scale or a C major and G major scales on a certain week. They'd have to come in and play it for her and they'd have to perform it at a level where it, you know, it, it, it's actually adequate to mm. you actually know it. So that would be what you were talking about, um, being able to a- achieve a certain thing. So I, I think there's a balance there. I think it depends what you see works because different things work for different people. You know, um, I think practice sheets can be fine, but, uh, you know, I think, yeah, it's certainly, I think you make a good point that having some kind of goal for the practice is a good idea too. Well, a lot of kids too will just sort of set the phone and and sort of watch it till twenty minutes goes by, and there I practiced, you know, right. Um, and that's not really productive. But so, what what advice would you have for beginning students who are just starting out? Well, I think probably one of the most important things is um, probably embouchure. Technically, it would be embouchure, um, and I think I think that that's so so critical uh, is is having a good embouchure and. Obviously, I have certain ideas on how to do embouchure, but I think, you know, there's lots of good embouchures. And I think you certainly want to have an embouchure that, that doesn't hurt you <laughs> and, and that uh, has a good clarinet sound. Um, and I, I, think the, the, I think one of the biggest things that I think is so critical for, for, a, for a student is to um, make a commitment to becoming a good clarinetist. Mm-hmm. And not just, you know, getting first chair or not just trying to win a competition or anything like that. I think it's it's a commitment to becoming a good clarinetist. And um, I think that's I've, I've been re- I'm I'm wandering a little bit. But this is really on my mind right now. Um, I've been I've been thinking for a year about some some uh, 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 clinic given by Paula Corley. She teaches down in South Texas. And, and she talks about two different kinds of clarinet students. She talks about um, test takers, and then she talks about an apprentice. Mm-hmm. And I've been lately thinking a lot about it. In fact, I even contacted her about it, and she had gotten some of it published by Van Doren recently. And so I've been reading through the document just yesterday, actually. And uh, a test taker would be a student who's committed to playing a piece of music or winning a competition or something like that, okay? But on the other hand, there's students who uh, want to become better on their instrument. They're more of an apprentice model. And so I I think that's a fascinating concept because I think oftentimes there's such a a high commitment, especially down here in Texas, to wanting to win competitions, which I think are good. But I think within winning competitions, you know, how do you win a competition? Well, you become a better clarinetist, mm-hmm. not just playing higher, louder, faster. It's how you play, and becoming somebody who does work on their embouchure, who does, who is able to count. You know, it does have good technical facility with their hands and their body and all those kinds of things. Well, it's very interesting the point you raise. Actually, and I find here we have a system called the RCM Royal Conservatory of Music, and and uh, I, I do think it's a great system. Actually, I talked to two of the guys on the show here in episode, uh, oh man, 12 or 13, I think. And, uh, but what I've noticed with some students is that they do start off kind of in that test taking mode. And a lot of them stay there. They'll stay there right up till grade eight, nine, they just pass the test and then they're, then they're kind of done. Right. But some students, when they get to a certain grade and they sort of realize that that's not the end of the world. And, and one student, for example, this year, next year, her goal is actually to get into the youth orchestra here. And, and that's kind of a different goal. It is more of a what you describe, you know? It's not exactly right. a, just a mark on a paper. It's actually an artistic sort of achievement. Well, yeah, and I think, and I think, I think certainly trying to accomplish certain things is a, is a great motivator. It's a great motivator for me. For example, I wanted to play really well at my concert last Friday night. But I know to really play well, I have to work on my scales. I have to work on my embouchure. I work on my embouchure every day you know, when I practice. And so, uh, you know, but I know it for, so for a concert to sound good, I have to have good technique. I have to, you know, uh, my hands have to stay relaxed. I have to do all this technical stuff. 
And so that's the key is to is to turn kids who are test taker onlys into kids that are really yes they want to win competitions great but they're also thinking becoming good clarinetists mm-hmm. and and I think that's one of the key goals for teachers is to you know we all do some rote teaching for example but not just rote only well and another very sort of telling sign is that you know if I ask you what what mark did you get on your concert the other day? <laughs> it wouldn't make sense, right? There are no, there's no such thing in the real world. Um, but for for kids, a lot of times their musical achievements are measured in grades or marks or little awards and things like that. But that you know, when you, when you played, what did you feel artistically that was different than when maybe you were a student doing that kind of thing? You know. Well, yeah, and that and that gets down to you know what is a successful performance. mm Hmm. You know, 15 years ago, I had my thinking really challenged by uh, Coach John Wooden, the basketball coach that I talk about periodically on my blog. Um, coach Wooden was the uh, possibly the most winning coach of all time. You know, his his uh, great basketball teams at UCLA in the 60s and 70s won 10 national championships in 12 years, and four of them were undefeated. But he, it, it, those results got everybody's attention, but how he did it was what was significant because he's, he never talked about winning at all. He only talked about preparing yourself as best you can, and then when it's time to do it, go for it. And so, you know, and that's the, that's the thing is, you know, if, if all you ever talk about is winning, then – you know, you're, you're going to limit how, how well you can do. It doesn't mean you don't want to win. doesn't mean you don't want to play well. But I think a lot of it was Coach Wooden. I thought a lot about this, and it really changed my attitude 15 years ago when I started reading Coach Wooden's books. Um, so my goal when I – so, for example, when I was uh, focused this last few weeks on this recital last Friday night I gave um, – I focused on my preparation because what I, I think the, I think it all came came through to me, having read John Wooden for 15 years, is what I what do I control? I don't ultimately control, for example, what people think about me. You know, I don't ultimately control even how well it comes out of my horn. You know, I I, I don't control that completely because you never know what's going to happen on any one day. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody might not like you. Or, I mean, I've been in auditions where flies attacked me and I couldn't even play. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me when I was a junior in high school. I had this fly attack. I was at this all-region competition in a high school. You know, and there's three judges with my their backs turned eating donuts and drinking Dr. Pepper. And this was a few years ago. And <laughs> I, I had a fly attack me and I couldn't even play. Well, there's nothing I could have done to control that. But I think, so what, so what, what are you saying? What I'm saying is... What is success? And I think success, John Wooden defines success as peace of mind that comes from knowing you made every effort to do the best of which you're capable. Mm. And I think there's two sides of it. I think the first side is the preparation. That's what I control, my getting ready. And then I think there's the effort at the moment. Okay, if you, if you look at the great book, Be Quick But Don't Hurry by Andy Hill, which he wrote in conjunction with John Wooden, he makes this very clear. Um, and so I control my preparation to get ready for something, and then I control my effort at the moment, right? Yeah. And, and you know, and, and when I went to the – because I was always – before 15 years ago, I was always bottom line. I was always results-oriented, and, and, and we are judged on our results. However, when I became committed to doing everything I could to getting ready within reason, you know, but doing everything I could to get ready, my preparation, and then at the moment – of performance, just going for it as best I could, my results went sky high. And I saw myself, I've performed better and taught better and enjoyed it more in the last 15 years than I've ever had in my whole career. So how can people sort of focus their mind in that way or practice better in order to have that better moment on stage? Yeah, well, let me, let me, let me throw out a concept here which is related to this. Um, this is something I really wanted to talk about today. Um, Oh, a few years ago, I was poking around and I came across an article. It was actually, I, actually, it was I think I got this from Bob Spring, the great clarinetist in, at Arizona State. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, it was an article written in, oh, a number of years ago uh, by Frank R. Wilson, who's a neurologist, or as they'd say where I'm from, a brain guy. 
Um, and the brain guy was talking about um, how the brain works in learning something. And he was specifically talking about music. Uh, this is this is a blog post I haven't written yet because I'm just not sure how to present this, you know. And as, and I was reading through this article, and he basically says that when you learn something, it goes into a certain part of your brain. And I've started calling this area just myself. I call this the loading area. So if I'm learning to do something, let's say I'm learning to tie my shoes. If I, when I was a little boy, I was learning to tie my shoes, right? And so I kind of learned, and I, my mom says, okay, do it like this, Mike. Okay. But eventually that information goes to a different part of your brain. It's, it's taken over there by the motor strip. I guess kind of like an Xbox controller, right? <laughs> eventually that information goes from one side of my brain to, the, to this other place in my brain, what I like to call the unloading area, and, and that I can just do it. So, so for example... When you got up this morning and you put your shoes on and tied your shoes, you didn't have to think about it. You could do it without what? Thinking. Thinking. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and I think, and so if I so you know so for example, if you pick up your clarinet and you play a C major scale, right? Well, how many C major? We can all just play the C major scale pretty much without thinking about it. Why? Why is that? Because we have loaded it very carefully and it got put into the unloading area. Okay. And there's at least two things about this loading, unloading thing that are, are significant for practicing and performing. And by the way, I think practicing and performing are interrelated. You know, mm. what do I what do I practice for? I practice to play, right? You know, and I and I think that it's very important. It's all about playing music. Why do I why do I practice? I practice so I can play music, right? And so, but anyway, but as far as loading and unloading go, I think there's two things. And the first thing about loading and unloading is the quality of the unloading, the quality of the unloading, the quality of my performing will always be based on the quality of what? Yeah, what you put in. What you put in, the quality of the loading. So, so I, I'm not going to unload anything that's not loaded well. And that's why slow practice is so important because, you, you know, so for example, if I load a piece of music and I'm really tense in my hands, well, then when I unload it, it's not going to come out almost certainly not going to come out relaxed, right? Yeah. <laughs> I had a student here a few years ago in my home studio. He's a little, little, a little boy and, and <laughs> he hadn't really loaded very carefully on this one uh, contest piece he was playing. And I said to him, I said, I said, so what you're planning on doing is unloading it correctly, even though you haven't loaded it correctly. And, and he just laughed. <laughs> yeah. I had a similar situation this week. A kid took his exam and then honestly, he kind of crammed for it. <laughs> and he, he was surprised that he, he had some issues when he, when he played it. And I was like, well, I'm not surprised. I mean, you, you can't load these skills. They're, they're, they're motor skills. They're physical. Like, you can't put them in there <laughs> like that and then expect to right. make them out, you know? Yeah, we can sort of do that. Yeah, I mean, it's also true. You never know on any one given day how a person's going to perform. And it's also true there's no guarantee. You can, you can load it carefully, and then you get to the point of performance and, phew, you know, forget it, right? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't come out because we've all – done this. You, performing is a very unusual thing because there's always factors that are outside of our control. You know, uh, I don't remember how many times I've, I used to play, I used to, I performed for years in the Paducah Symphony. And I can remember uh, playing in Paducah Symphony, some big solo, you know, uh, like Rachmaninoff, was it Rachmaninoff 2? And I'm playing along and I play beautifully, and I, and I think to myself, wow, that went really well. And then, of course, I missed notes on the next passage because I was thinking about how proud I was. About <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so I guess performing well can mess you up as well as making mistakes. Yeah. But, but, but I think the truth is the better I load, though, the easier it is to perform. And, and this, is, this is the second thing I wanted to say besides the quality of the unloading is based on the quality of the loading. The second thing I wanted to say is, and if Frank R. Wilson alludes to this in the article, is when I perform, I need to make sure I perform from the part of my brain 
that's meant for it. So, for example, um, if it's true that, that we load into the loading area, we need to make sure we unload from the unloading area. Mm. And this, this is, you know, rushing off. You know, and his, his his great method, which is out of print, unfortunately, talks about not thinking, and, and that's the idea here: is you just trust what you've loaded and you go for it. You know, they they just you just go for it. You don't try to be careful because it seems to me if I if I start trying to be careful when I'm performing, then I'm sort of going back over to that loading area. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Oh yeah, yeah. And so if I start being careful, and that's why oftentimes if I'm performing and I, and I start being too careful and I start thinking about it, I'm sort of doing loading activities. No, no, we have to just go for it as best we can. I was on Spain. La I was in Spain last summer and I played the last movement of uh, the, the uh, chocolates, which is very difficult. Triple Mocha Indulgence, this wild piece by James Grant, which is a, a written out jazz solo, actually. And very difficult. I practiced on it forever. And but when I was on stage and I was on stage in Spain playing, I just kept thinking, unload, unload, unload. Don't be thinking about things, just let it rip. Yeah. And you know, it came out real well. And I but I just remember being on stage specifically thinking, okay, I've got to do this. <laughs> because you can say it, you can teach this stuff all day long to kids, but you have to do it yourself, right? And uh so so yeah, so I think I think the loading ever since I've gotten into this loading and unloading thing. It's really helped my students because you just start understanding how it really works. Well, and then and, I think they're more, you know, apt to spend the time learning it because it doesn't seem so arduous. Well, learning. yeah, it, that's right. It could, and it's also true. This loading and unloading thing is really kind of the way we live our life. It's kind of like when you go to school on the first day to a new school. At first, you don't know where your classroom is. You're looking at the number on the door. You're being careful. But after a few weeks, you just sort of go to that English class. You know, you don't have to think room two, 222. You just go right to that English class, right? Yeah. So, you know, and I, and I think, I think you know, even young students are able to understand that idea that what you put in is what you're going to get out. And if I spend my time practicing carefully and loading carefully, then you have a better chance to unload what you want. And you have a better chance to, to get a good performance. So. So you've mentioned the embouchure being super important, and we talked yes. about this sort of concept of loading. Um, what are some items that people should ideally load in there then? I mean, I, I think that articulation is one a lot of people struggle with. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Well, let me talk about, let me talk big picture, and then let me talk about tonguing specifically. Um, yeah, in fact, let me, let me throw out how I think about basics, okay? Um, you know, uh, uh, 20 years ago, I was teaching a, a band camp. I was early in my career, and uh, I was getting ready to teach a band camp out in West Texas. And I was thinking about basics like tonguing and relaxation and all these kinds of things. And I wanted to come up with a cute acrostic that I could remember and easily understand. You know, it's like USA, United States of America, you know, or um, something like that. So I could I could easily explain it. So I was laying in bed. Uh, thinking about this the night before this camp, and all of a sudden it came to me: A R T C, artsy, and you know, and I was, <laughs> I, 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 that's it. And so I, I, I started shaking my wife who was asleep, and I said, "And Leslie, I've got it, artsy. That's it." Well, she wasn't nearly as excited about that as I was. She told me to go back to sleep, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, <laughs> every. Ever since I learned that about or thought of that 20 years ago, I've been teaching that. And the ARTC, A stands for approach or attitude, and that's being confident or anything relating to the mind. R is relaxation, breathing, posture, things like that. The T is tone, which is embouchure and tonguing, which we'll talk about in a second. And then C is counting, having a steady pulse and then correctly doing the, the rhythmic pattern. And so those are kind of some of the basic concepts, A-R-T-C, artsy, get it, artsy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, those, are the, that, those are kind of the concepts that I'm trying to get into my playing to help me play music better. And so, um, but with respect to tonguing, which is under T-tone, I think tonguing and embouchure are heavily interrelated. And that's something that I didn't understand until oh, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I started. I started thinking about this, and I realized that tonguing is very can really mess your embouchure up. I would have students come in, you know, and they'd audition, 
And I'd say, okay, you know, Billy, play a C major scale. And, and they'd slur a scale, and I thought, wow, that's a really good tone. You know, that sounds really good. And then I'd say, okay, now tongue the scale for me. And then it wouldn't sound very good, especially in the upper register. <laughs> it sounds kind of bad. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And well, it's because there's an inter – they're different. Embouchure and tonguing are different, but they're interrelated. And so, and so they really started, started firing my thinking to think of it. And so – I think I think as far as tonguing, I like to think of tonguing in three basic uh, ways. I teach tonguing. Okay, remembering that tonguing is always interrelated with embouchure. We can talk about that in a minute too, if you like. Um, but I, I think I, I have what I call basic tonguing. Okay, that's the basic tongue stroke on the reed. I mean, if you had a note and you tongued it, how would you do that? And then, and then once you get, then I, when I get that more or less established, then I go to uh, advanced single tonguing, you could call it. And that's where you come into learning to do legato tonguing, uh, staccato, different kinds of shadings on tonguing and whatnot. Okay. So, so how would you explain the basic tonguing then that you just well, thank described? Thank you. Yeah. Now, well, first of all, let me, let me go ahead and confess that I, I think there's a certain number of people who have to anchor tongue. Yeah, it isn't oh. the German tradition. A lot of them anchor tongue, anyways. Oh, I, I, I would guess that's true. I I know in Cecil. Now I'm being nerdy. Uh, in the Cecil <laughs> in the Cecil Gold book from the early '70s, where they interviewed, you know, all these people, uh, all the clarinet professors in the country, including you know Mitchell Lurie and and, and etc. Uh, they actually was like 30 percent anchor tongue in the responses, approximately, mm -hmm. and I, probably higher because a lot of people don't want to admit their anchor tongue because. I know there's a lot of prejudice out there amongst amongst a certain famous teachers who you know go around saying that nobody that's any good to anchor tongues. Well, I think a lot of good players anchor tongue, um, and but nevertheless, and I, I I think you know I think we got to be careful. Now I'm not sure I would advocate anchor tonguing, but I think it depends on how you do it. Everybody's tongue shape is different, you know. Some people have long tongues, some people have short tongues, and uh, but generally, what I I'm pretty orthodox. I, I teach tip to tip. Tonguing, mm -hmm. and so the tip of the reed to the tip of the or the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. Except what I mean is, I don't mean if you stick your finger out in front of you, I don't mean the end of your finger. I mean like where the fingernail is, you know, the top of the tip of the tongue. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so and so and but when I mean tip of the reed, I don't mean the ow ow pointy cut your tongue tip. I mean right under the tip, right. Yeah, like sort of a little oval shape just on the very... Yeah, right to the top. And so so the top of the tip of the tongue to right under the tip of the reed. So top of the tip of the tongue to right under the tip of the reed. Or the top of the tip of the tongue to right under the tip of the reed. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, just entertaining myself here on a, <laughs> a, a Thursday morning. Um, yeah, uh, but as far as tonguing goes, you know, and I, I think I think... The proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, how does it sound, right? And I think, uh, I think basic tonguing is what a lot of people miss because a lot of pros, even some pros, need work on their tonguing. You know, uh, it's kind of like clarinet tone. Sometimes pros have a clarinet tone only another clarinet player could love. You know, uh, a lot of pros kind of honk, you know, and it doesn't sound very good except for other clarinet players, you know, because they study with a famous teacher. What, what are your something. thoughts on tonguing while you're tonguing? I mean, tongue position, I mean, in the mouth. Oh, tongue position. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of this depends on your setup and what you play on. But what works for me and my students um, is, is basically the higher I go on the clarinet, the higher my air position is. And, and that's how I like to say tongue position. See, I never understood for a long, long time the, the idea of tongue position, maybe because I have a slight speech impediment, I guess. Be, but, um, you know, I never understood this tongue position thing. But what got through to me, oh, I think 11 years ago when I was working on this, um, I, started, I started fooling around with the idea of air position. Mm -hmm. You know, and, which is what tongue position does, if you think about it. it. It changes the way the air goes through the mouth. Because really... When you play clarinet, as far as embouchure and whatnot, all you really do is make a good place for the reed to vibrate, 
and then you change the way the air hits the reed, right? Yeah. Okay, that's what you really do is, is you have a good place for the reed to vibrate and then you change the way the air is. And, of course, how you say that, it, there's a million different ways to do it. As, as Tim Phillips said, my friend Tim Phillips at Troy says, you know, you get the pressures right. You know, you get everything right. And, and uh, But I think, uh, you know, having higher air, it seems like the higher the air goes through the mouth works better the higher you play. And it also helps in tongue position. So I, I dreamed on my... Uh, single lip, double lip embouchure, which I recently, it's the old 5C embouchure. Um, the, the, idea, the idea of that, along with the embouchure tips that goes with it, is, is I, I think below open G, I, I, I use the voicing T, the French syllable T, T, like sacre bleu, bleu, bleu. Which, by <laughs> the way, by the way, that's kind of a bad thing to say, at least, at least it used to be. <laughs> but anyway, never, we don't know that in the United States. Um, but, uh, bleu, uh, Tew, 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 like that. Uh, and then, by the way, I got all this. I got so much of this. I have to confess, this is not original to me. A lot of the things I've been teaching on embouchure um, are really refinements from the great Joe Allard. And you've mm. probably read me talk about him. Um, uh, let me just take an take a, a excursion on Joe Allard here a minute, which I, I need to confess. Um, what happened is, you know, I'm pretty much in my clarinet teacher is pretty straight laced, you know. My teachers have lineage back to Bonad and even Marcellus and, and the great clarinet teachers of the past. Um, but when I was in college, I studied for a couple of years with a teacher in New York who had studied with Joe Allard for 10 years. And he showed me an embouchure that I still play with. And, um, it, you know, and then after I finished my doctorate, I was able, I was able to do here a master class by, by one of Joe Allard's students. And it kind of fired my imagination on Joe Allard's ideas, and I picked up a, a dissertation written on Joe Allard by Deborah McKim up in Nebraska, and and she had interviewed a lot of Joe Allard students, so it set me off on this course uh, when I finished my doctorate of really exploring Joe Allard's pedagogy. See, he never wrote anything. Now, for those of you that don't know who Joe Allard was, he was a very famous clarinet and saxophone teacher in New York City, and and he was active, you know, in the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, all in there. And he, basically, he taught lessons all day in a storefront across from Carnegie Hall or later at Juilliard and, and whatnot. But he also played radio shows. He played clarinet and saxophone in Bell Telephone Hour and the great radio and early television shows. And so that was his career. And so he was always investigating and learning things. And so, but he never wrote anything. So, uh, but all of his students, you know, passed down his ideas. And I was sort of, I'm sort of a second generation Joe Allard student. And so what I started doing after I finished my doctorate in the, the mid-90s is I spent a lot of time trying to unpack what Joe Allard was trying to say. And uh, I think it's been, very, it's been very difficult because Joe Allard was such a genius that he could give you what you needed. Mm -hmm. And so he could come in and he would say, do this or do that. And so if you listen to some different Joe Allard students – especially later in his career when everybody was really good who went and studied with him, you know, whether it be Michael Brecker or Eddie Daniels or whoever, um, you know, he would kind of make an adjustment to fix you, which I think is really an advanced way to teach something I want to do better myself, is being able to come in and not just have certain principles that I have, like Joe Allard had, but to be able to fix you and give you what you need. And I think that's when you're really doing it. And so anyway, but, but it finally got through to me that one of Joe Allard's big concepts he tended to teach everybody was to let the reed vibrate, you know, because I think so many of the embouchures that we play with, and it's reflected in tonguing, is they're kind of like pressure embouchures. It's a matter of just pressing the reed, you know, uh, so much of the push down with the top lip thing that some, some, some taught so much these days, you're just going to pinch the reed. And that's why I think that's why you get into people playing harder and harder reeds you know, and they're just, there's kind of this pressure thing. And I'm not sure that's, I, I just, I'm not sure I like that. I, I, I think there's a better way. I, I would and, agree for sure. I, I used to play on a really, really closed mouthpiece with an extremely hard read. Um, lots of pressure in the embouchure. And I always had trouble with my articulation. And, and a couple right. of years ago, I, I, well, a few years ago now, I guess, but I, I did manage to sort of reset it for myself and completely redo it. And I've had no trouble since. No fatigue, well, yeah. no, no kind of this squawking tension feel. Like it's much better for me. And I think it's very important to find that. Right. Well, and, and, you know, and I, I just put, I'm doing a, at a big conference here in Texas, 
I'm doing a, a big clinic. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is, is the single lip, double lip embouchure, which is basically refinements on Joe Allard's ideas. I've tried to take the, the Allard ideas as best I understand them and put my own spin on them and, and put it out. And so, um, for example, I, I, one way to look at single lip, double lip embouchure is – you know what's so great about double lip embouchure? Because a lot of a lot of great clarinet players, some of the best clarinet players of all time, Harold Wright played double lip. I believe Stoltzman himself plays double lip. Mm. You know some of the best clarinet players in the world play double lip. What's so great about double lip? I think one of the things that's so great about double lip is that you can't pinch the reed <laughs> because if you do, it'll hurt. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so and so you're going to limit. How much you pin, you're not going to bite down and push down really hard with your top teeth and pinch that reed underneath. You're not going to do that because it's, it hurts. So, so double lips really one of the things that's cool about double lip is, as Tim Phillips says, you get the pressures right. You're not biting down too much. You're going to allow that reed to vibrate, and you're going to get a prettier sound, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Allard's idea is that you know that I'm trying to push is the idea of not biting down too hard and letting the reed vibrate. And so, so uh, really what Allard was doing, and, and, it, and I talked to a guy in New York a couple years ago, and he said this. He said what Allard was really doing was a single-lip version of a double-lip embouchure. And if you go on my blog and you look, you look for single-lip, double-lip embouchure, I, that's on there, and I go through the steps and whatnot. But the idea is you let the reed vibrate. And that's really the key. And, 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 you know, I can almost, I can actually hear when people are letting the reed vibrate, it's a certain kind of sound. And, you know, if, if you, if you, I know I was listening uh, to um, Eric Dolphy, the great bass clarinetist, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was, a while back, I was listening to a YouTube clip of him and he studied with Joe Allard. And uh, if you listen to, if you listen to Eric Dolphy, that bass clarinet sound on, on God Bless the Child is that's the sound, it's a certain sound of letting the reed vibrate. You know, and so and so, you know, uh, my daughter, for example, she she understands this so well. She can actually hear, even even when a marching band is marching on the football field, she can tell the clarinets when they're biting. She can say, "Oh, they're biting," because you can just hear the pinch of the mouthpiece. Oh yeah, it's and a really, it's it's, a, it's 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 bad. It's a tough sound to hear. Like it's and after a while, it's like, please just stop. You know. <laughs> well, I know. And one of the things I'm trying to do, trying to do down here in Texas, is push forward this idea of letting the reed vibrate and, and getting a certain kind of clarinet. I think it's a better sound. I think it's more fun to play this way. And um, yeah, one more thing. One more thing. I, I think one of the things that this is also related to what I learned from the study in Joe Allard as a second generation student, is that I think Allard lets us join the rest of the music community. And what I mean by that is this, you know, every, everybody in the world knows, like if you're a singer or you're a trumpet player or whatnot, we, they know that you have to know how it feels in your body to get the, the note to come out the way it sounds right. So if I'm at my, I'm a big Texas Ranger baseball fan. Okay. They're in first place. I'm so happy. <laughs> so, so if I go to go 25 minutes from my house and oh that's great. <laughs> but if I'm at the Ranger game and they we sing the star spangled banner. Okay. National anthem. You know, I don't think, Oh, I have to stretch my vocal cords 0.5 of an inch or what? No, I just know how it, what feels feels in my body right if or if you're a trumpet player you have the overtones and you sort of know how it feels right and see only in the clarinet world it seems to me in the b flat clarinet world the soprano clarinet world do we have this attitude of wanting to set my embouchure and blow mm -hmm. you know and that's the way the you know generations of past taught clarinet you know you set your embouchure and blow and um but you I, know, don't, and I don't even think the people who do that are actually doing that. Or the people who advocate, they're not actually doing that. They are making small adjustments. They just don't tell you about them. That's exactly right. I think you're dead right. In fact, I was hearing a very famous orchestral uh, clarinetist, one of the best in the world, do a master class a few years ago. And he was working on it with a student on, on a very famous piece. And... You know, and this student, he was saying, oh, you need to be a little sharper on this one note. You need to do this. 
and try this special fingering. And he showed him a special fingering for this note. And, you know, and it made it better. And then the, then the famous clarinetist said, oh, play it like this. And he went over and he played it. And I know so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, fixed it in his voicing, in his air position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fixed it in his air position and put it in the right place. And it was all I could, this was about 20 years ago, and I was really starting to think about this kind of stuff. And I just wanted to raise my hand and say, Mr. So-and-so, why don't you tell him what's really going on and that you made a fix in your embouchure? Because he mm -hmm. never mentioned that to the student. Now, it's possible that Mr. So-and-so just did it intuitively. He just didn't know it. Or as, as Mark Nuccio said, you know, my tongue is is like a, when I'm playing in the New York Philharmonic, my tongue is like a rudder going downstream. You know, he just kind of does it. And so maybe Mr. So-and-so was just did it intuitively, but I think we need to tell students that, yes, you have to make an adjustment. It is true that the clarinet is the most set of all the embouchures. Yeah, 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 okay, right, okay. But within that, we have to make adjustments in the voicing and, and whatnot. We have to make adjustments. And, you know, I heard somebody once say, well, you should stay set on the outside of your mouth, but on the inside, you should change the voicing. Yeah. Uh, I would respect. I would respectfully challenge anybody try to do that. Well, actually, I, I was just going to tell you one of the things I like to show my students about voicing. If they if they in any way doubt me and they think they're just pushing buttons, what I'll do is I'll I'll set my embouchure and I'll I'll play a full range F major scale. And what's really interesting is by about the time you get past a a, a, a G on the top of the staff, the notes all sound the same. There's no way that the reed can respond properly to the air and the embouchure that I'm giving it. It's just a honk at that point, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you have to know the right spot, and that's why I use the. That's why the syllables are so valuable. So below open G, I use uh, Q open G to about C in the staff T, and then above that I use the syllable D, and that those tend to get the the the, uh, the air positions higher with me. Now I think if, if in case anybody's from another culture, I think the 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 uh, air positions or the syllables might be a little different if you speak a different language, maybe an Asian language, I'm not quite sure. But I know at least where I'm from here in Texas, growing up in the United States, they seem to work real well. But I think the concept is still true. Whatever syllables you use, the air going higher through your mouth, the higher you go, seems seems to work. Well, I think one thing that's being exposed to this entire discussion is, is not only do people learn in different ways, people interpret things in different ways and then people actually are different. Like right. um, what might work for someone doesn't necessarily work for, for someone else and even the way of explaining something. Right. So um, along those same lines though, what, what do you think about gear? I mean, so many people are obsessed with trying to get the next greatest whatever to try and improve themselves, but then they won't spend the same time on their own, their own embouchure or their own artsy system or <laughs> that kind of thing. What, what are your thoughts on that? With respect to equipment, I, I tend to have what I call a balanced view toward equipment. I think uh, on the you want to. It's like oftentimes in life you have a you know the middle path, right? Uh, you know. Um, so for example, uh, you know I try not to obsess on equipment because some clarinet players are searching for the holy grail of mouthpieces. Uh, you know, read, read, um, etc. And and I think after a while, it, you know. It costs a lot of money to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and the thing about chasing after equipment constantly, you know, is that you need to learn to play it right, especially if it takes a long time to learn how it feels, right, where the air position is. I mean, I can say, you know, when you play an open G, whisper T, but what does that mean, right? What does that mean? How does that feel in your body? You have to experiment. Where is that right place, especially since open G tends to be acoustically low to pitch, right? We can talk about that sometime. <laughs> um, but, but you know, how, how do you voice that? How do you do that? Well, if, if you're constantly changing ligatures and mouthpieces and, read, and you know, different kinds of reeds and different strengths of reeds and whatnot, well, you're going to take forever. You're never going to be able to be able to find how it feels. As Joe Allard said, every note has its own special feeling. Well, you're not going to find that feeling if you're constantly changing equipment. On the other hand, I think good equipment is vital. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think a lot of people are playing on equipment they shouldn't be playing on, you know. And and we, we live in a day where there's just great choices, you know. 
uh, yeah, and you know, we have great mouthpiece makers out there who are just doing amazing things. Some of the mouthpiece makers are turning out, you know, the best mouthpieces that's ever been made. Really, well, there is it, amazing you know, selection nowadays. You know, and it's great equipment. The, the vendors out there, uh, shout out to them. They've just done tremendous work of pushing out all these great horns and that play so in tune compared to what they used to play. If you listen to orchestras, for example, in Bonad's day, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, and you listen to these old, even, even if you listen to some of the older recordings from the 50s, things are not as in tune as they are now. Now, a lot of that's, you know, digital technology, but a lot of that is just how good the orchestras are. If you listen to a live performance of, of one of the great orchestras today, it's amazingly in tune. It's amazing. And, and, uh, and some of that's, is, is, is equipment is part of it. Well, you know, the equipment's so good. And I, I think, I think the biggest thing, let me say one more thing, um, on equipment, make sure, let, let me give, let me give, let me give your listeners a criteria for evaluating equipment. Okay. Cause I kind of have a three tiered thing. So if I'm evaluating a ligature or a barrel, bar barrels are very important by the way, um, or a mouthpiece for me, um, obviously tone is important but i'm going to argue that not just tone quality but response mm -hmm. if it doesn't play easy forget it if, if it has the best tone quality in the world but you come in late oh gosh you're dead right you're doing the big solo at the end of at the end of uh not on ball mountain right man if that if that if, if you don't if you don't have the response to come right in on that high note you're dead you know you know, and, 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 and you have to come in. And so I think response is number one. Does it play easy for you? And then I think, so number one's responsiveness. Number two is tone quality. And then number three would be tuning in, in different registers and whatnot. So those are my three criteria for evaluating uh, equipment, even clarinets themselves. You know, does it play easy? Does it play with the tone you like? And does it, is it, uh, play in tune? Is it playing the kind of tuning that you want in, in, in with itself and whatnot? So those are, those are uh, the criteria I have. And so I think it really is. And also, I think there's some ligatures, specifically there's some ligatures out there, and I don't want to use any names, but they're leather strappy type ligatures that really constrict the reed. Some of the leather strap ones, neoprene or whatever, that really just grab that reed they produce a dark sound in the students, but they're so darn resistant, you can barely play. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of kids down here in Texas where I am, they put the students on these mouthpieces, and they, it, it kind of sounds good to them, but it's just no fun to play. And then I'll come along with the, the – I play on BG, the BG ligatures. I play in Revelation and Super Revelation. Uh, and so uh, you know, I put like my BG Revelation on there, my Super Revelation – and which is which is dark, but it's also responsive. And the students usually just go crazy because they suddenly can play, and it's just a whole lot more fun to play when you don't have that pressure. See, those really restrictive neoprene type leather strap ligatures really grab the reed, but and it creates once again pressure. And so you can imagine a world of biting and pressure. <laughs> So many band teachers do listen to the podcast, and a lot of educators, uh, it's such a busy job, they've got so many instruments to teach and, and work with. Um, how can they help their clarinet players get into equipment that's going to advance them, um, even if they don't have a private teacher to consult? Well, yeah, I think one of the important things is to is stick to the major brands. Um, you know, there's the major instrument makers, uh, the Buffets, the Yamahas, Selmers, the major brands of instruments are the, the, all the, the instruments are good. The, the major manufacturers are turning out great um, clarinets and, and uh, mouthpieces and whatnot. If you stick to those, you'll generally be in pretty good shape. I think one of the things you have to be careful is just chasing after the latest snake oil. You know, mm -hmm. somebody comes along, along with some exotic something. And now there are some breakthrough. Uh, clarinet inventors and whatnot who've done some amazing things. However, in general, if you stick to the major brands, uh, you're not going to go too far afield. Um, and, and it can also, you know, most people like me, look, any, I, I welcome any if, any calls. If anybody ever has any questions, just go to clarinetmike.com and you can 
uh, my contact information, even my phone number, my cell number is on, it's actually sitting on the internet. Um, so just call me or send me an email, send me a text and let me know. I, I welcome, a, I welcome, I give some free consulting for any of your uh, uh, listeners. Just give me a call and, and I'll, I'll say, well, hey, try this, try that. And uh, I'm hesitant to give specifics here. Um, it's also true, oftentimes equipment tends to run up or down because so many of the instruments, for example, are made in China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and almost all of them, basically, uh, my understanding is. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, things, the quality control in some of these factories goes up and down. And so you might, the, what's good, what's not good, you know, and certainly reeds run hot and cold on, on the shipments. That's happened lately. So, yeah, so don't be scared. I think if you're a band director out there, just don't be scared to contact somebody. You can always, look, you can always call a clarinet mic. I'm very happy any time to consult on anything for free. Just let me know. I'd love to help you. And, and I'm sure a lot of, uh, so many of the clarinet pros feel the same way I do. Uh, a, a, you know, good question about something. Just ask somebody. It's like it's like if you go to the library and you can't find something, just go ask a librarian. They'll help you, and and that's what I would do is just find out and you know what's what's not. But I think generally staying into the major brands is fine. I think you have to be careful. You know, there's there's always a real interest in trying to you know, get out in front and be at the cutting edge, which is is good. I I I think that's good. But I think sometimes some of the exotic things going on, you know. You got to be careful there. It's we had a huge problem here a couple of years ago. Well, I mean, huge problem is relative, but but uh, Costco had a sale on band instruments before the school year, and so a whole bunch of students, instead of paying the rental fee for their instrument like normal, actually just went out and for about the same as the rental fee, picked up these horrible Costco things. Uh, and uh, I always call those. See, uh, parents would call me and say, "Well, I don't understand why you know the rental's a hundred dollars for the year, but I can get this clarinet for one thirty nine from Costco and." And uh, I would just tell them, you know, look, I, I just call those CSOs, clarinet shaped objects. Like, <laughs> that's about where it ends, you know. It's not really something to work with. So, I mean, you could get ten of those for the price, maybe of a a couple of normal standard clarinets, but man, you won't see the the use out of them. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think you pay for what you get. And, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, those are just bad. It, well, the manufacturing is bad. The materials are bad, and. You know, and, and sometimes you just have to tell, tell a parent, well, look, it's made out of bad materials and it's manufactured poorly. So mm -hmm. guess how it's going to sound? It's going to sound bad because one of the most important things to get a, ha a handle on it with, I think, what we do is that l there's really just little bitty changes make a big difference. You know, for example, if you're pushing down with your top lip just a little, well, that's going to goof you up, right? Mm -hmm. If just the littlest bit can really make a big difference or as John Wooden used to say big thing uh, little things make big things happen he used to say little things make big things happen and i you know and so you take a clarinet made out of bad materials manufactured badly well man it may look like it but honestly a little here and a little there it doesn't play in tune doesn't play the good sound it breaks you can't fix it many repair people won't even fix those clarinets because they're made out of such bad metal the metals the kind of metal they use in kids toys at the store right well that's the other thing that happens actually parents will complain oh i took it to whatever store and they won't work on it it's like well the reason they don't is because they can't guarantee their work and they might break it if they do anything to it <laughs> well, that's right and you know if you're if you're gonna it, all you're doing is really just throwing your money away yeah on, on those on those instruments they're not real instruments so in respect for time here and listeners' sure. time and, and ours, I think that what we've learned here is we definitely should have you back to chat about some more stuff in the future. Oh, well, that would be great. You're open to that because we've uh, still got lots to talk about, I'm sure. And uh, if any listeners have questions, please go ahead and forward those along. I think that um, if we have Clarinet Mike back here in the future, that'd be a great chance to to address some of those. So if anything sort of piqued your interest or you want to talk about or hear more, that'd be a great thing to address. Um, where can we find you online? You've got your blog, you've got your website. Is there a Facebook page or? Anything yeah, like yeah, uh, yeah, and it just it. My name is Michael. You can the best place to reach me is if you go to clarinetmike.com and scroll to the bottom. There's links to my to my blog, links to my Facebook, links to all those things. Okay, and um, that's a good way. Or just you, you know, if you just Google clarinet Mike, you'll probably find me. Um, 
but clarinetmike.com is uh, my base website. And then there's links at the bottom of the page to go to the various sites. So, Michael, before we wrap up, you've been very generous with the giveaway on the podcast today. And a uh, lucky winner will receive a signed copy of your latest CD. And uh, we featured the music of that at the beginning of the episode here. What would you like to share about that? Well, yeah, the, the CD called Mysteries is um, a really interesting CD. I had, I had a, a number of pieces I collected. And um, this is sort of an odds and ends CD. <laughs> These were pieces that I had uh, come up with as I developed a one-man show. I have, to, I have a one-man show. I can go out and, and play pieces that are unaccompanied or clarinet and tape or, you know, CD. And, and so they're just little different pieces I, I either got from other places or developed, adapted from other instruments. And it's sort of an, uh, I couldn't call the CD odds and ends because who wants to buy a CD called odds and ends? <laughs> but I called it mysteries after one of the pieces that's on here. And there's some really interesting pieces on here that I think people will find interesting. And th what's also interesting on the CD is the, this, the difficulty level is not, is not out in outer space. One of the things I believe in is commissioning and finding works that a, a good college student or even a good high school student, a really good high school student, but at least a college student could, could perform. Because I think there's, there's a whole lot of music out there that nobody can play. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I think that's fine. And that's, that's what I know in some places it's almost like a rite of passage you know, can you, can you have to have the prerequisite circular breathing and super high C's and, and all that. And that's fine. People want to do that more power to them. That's great. And, you know, I, I don't feel a need to have to do that. I've played the Messian Quartet and the Nielsen Concerto, and I've done all that. But for me, I want to commission works and find works that more people can actually perform new music that's interesting and cool, but that's you can learn it in a few months and you can play it, not music you have to go into a cave for three years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or whatever, you know, or that's limited to this, to this 1% of 1% people that can actually perform it, you know? And, and so that's one of the things that I've tried to do. And I feel like this CD is loaded with really interesting music that people can actually play that, that that's kind of fun and cool. So uh, I encourage you to check out the music that's on there. I think it's interesting. And we can purchase that on your website if we're not lucky enough to win one. Yeah. We, it, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's links on, there's links on it through my website. If you just go to CD Baby and, and type in Michael Dean Clarinet, you'll find it there. Um, it's also on Amazon and some other iTunes. You can download it off iTunes. So check it out. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today, Michael, and I look forward to having you back in the future. Oh, that'll be so much fun. I, I thank you so much. This has been a real treat. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. <laughs>